Hello and welcome. My name is Mark Akers and I am the director of the Institute for Child Development and Family Relations at California State University, San Bernardino. We provide resources to families and parents in the Inland Region. So it is my distinct pleasure today to introduce Dr. Matt Quinlan. Dr. Quinlan is a former member of the faculty here at CSUSB and is currently a psychology instructor at Coastline College in Costa Mesa. Dr. Quinlan teaches courses related to psychobiology, developmental psychology, and research methods, and his primary areas of research interest are in the neurobiological mechanisms associated with reward and motivation. We're very fortunate to have Dr. Quinlan here today to talk about some of his work, and so I will turn it over to him. Matt, thanks so much for being here today. Yeah, no problem. <clears throat> I'm really excited to be here. Uh, looking forward to this. Uh, first, I want to say thanks to everybody for coming. Uh, I know everyone's real busy, and uh, I know it's lunchtime, so uh, thanks for taking the time to come and uh, listen. So today, I wanted to talk about uh, the psychology of love. Uh, like uh, Dr. Eggers was saying, my background is more in uh, biopsychology or neuroscience, whatever you want to call it. So I want to talk about uh, how biology supports our love-related uh, behaviors, right? So first, uh, I want to start with a couple of general questions for you guys, just to get everybody thinking. Uh, so I like this quote, like, love is like an hourglass that your heart fills up and then your brain empties. I always think that's kind of funny because uh, we've all experienced some moments where we are uh, feeling like we're in love with someone and we do behaviors or do things that we wouldn't normally do. So there's this push and this pull between uh, what our biology wants us to do and what we know uh, our social rules or other things uh, would have us normally do. So it's just kind of an interesting idea. So just to get us started a little bit, I want you guys to think, uh, have you ever loved someone? I know we can't really talk, but just think about it. Have you ever loved someone like uh, a family member, um, a significant other, uh, anything, anyone, right? So most people usually say yes. Uh, I can think we can say that love is common to most people. Uh, most people have experienced some form of that, right? So now I want you to think a little more about uh, where do we find love around the world? Do we see love just in the United States, just in our culture, or is there love in many other societies? Right. Typically, people will say, well, of course, I mean, everybody can experience love. We see it all over the world. So we can say love is something that's like cross-cultural. It's all over the place. Right. If we keep thinking and going along with this line of reasoning here, uh, I like to think about like, can babies love? This one's a little bit harder. Think about like infants, three months old, six months old. What do you guys think? You just think about it in your own head. Can babies love? I would say maybe we can't ask them or anything, but we can certainly look at behaviors, right? And if we say that babies can love us back and show that, then maybe love is like innate, right? We don't need to learn it. We don't need anybody to show us. We can just automatically uh, be able to exhibit love and feel love and things like that, right? So maybe you don't have a baby or haven't been around babies a lot, but what do you think about this one? Can animals show love? This one's a little more controversial a little bit. I'm sure some of you guys have cats and dogs. In my house, we recently got a new cat and it's been interesting to watch my uh, kids, they're six and four, two boys, kind of interact with this new cat and how the cat is learning how to interact with them. And to me, at least anecdotally speaking, I think that animals do exhibit behaviors that are indicative of love. So I can say, or I can think and uh, suggest, love is not just unique to humans, but we see it in other species as well. Right, even close species to humans like chimps, um, bonobos, things like that. Right. So in general, we can say love is likely, at least a little bit, uh, a product of our biology, of our evolution. Right. And by that I mean it helps us survive in the environment. Right. Love is adaptive. It helps keeps us alive. It helps keep us alive, and it helps us interact with our environment in a way so we can be successful. Right. So this could be with reproduction, right? Physical love, which leads to parenting and paternal maternal love, or we can see this in pair bonding and trust and support amongst partner relationships. So I was kind of thinking about what I wanted to talk about today and what I wanted to, um, you know, hear feedback from you guys about is partner relationships, right? So I was digging around looking for some information and I wanted to kind of take the angle 
of how partner relationships affect child development, right? And family stuff. So there's, I picked a couple uh, studies here, but in general, we can agree, and there's a lot of evidence showing that marital relations and interactions between two parents do affect child well being. I even uh, came across one study where in interactions, marital interactions or partner interactions before parenthood, before someone gets pregnant, are predictive of how their child will develop. And this particular study found that to be true, even interactions nine years before parenthood, which is pretty crazy to think about, right? We also know that relationship quality, the frequency of conflict and conflict with children or about children uh, between two parents uh, can create uh, certain risk factors in childhood developmental trajectories, right? So how parents act towards each other is pretty important. Co-parenting and marital satisfaction have big links with the parent-child relationship. So think like attachment theory and stuff like that. You know, a healthy attachment helps uh, development go more smoothly and helps for a better adulthood, a more successful adulthood, right? And I was also kind of thinking about this because most of the studies are between male-female partners, but uh, there's also a few studies of same-sex relationships, and there's no differences in the above findings, right? So if there's parenting stress in the same-sex relationship, we see the same kind of effects uh, in child development uh, and vice versa, right? So for today, as we go through all this, what I want you guys to focus on is sort of the biological influences that underlie our partner relationships and how that could affect child development. So what I'm mostly gonna talk about is how biology and um, evolution influences uh, the partnerships, but in the back of your mind, we can think about how that will have an effect on children as well, right? So here we go. Uh, like Dr. Eggers was saying, uh, my background is more like neuroscience, things like that. And I originally studied uh, drugs in the brain and how drugs work and why they're rewarding. And what I learned as I kept studying and doing more research is that a lot of things are rewarding and they all activate the same pathway. So this is the basic biological pathway that's involved in reward and motivation. So you guys may have heard this. I recognize a couple names in the audience from my classes. So you probably heard me talk about this before when I was at CSUSB, uh, but the VTA is right here. And whenever we have something rewarding, whether it be a drug, right? Alcohol, cocaine, anything like that, or something like chocolate or sugar or different kinds of love, dopamine is released from the VTA and goes to the nucleus accumbens. And that's like the biological basis of reward and pleasure and things like that, right? That dopamine from here also goes to the PFC, which you guys may have heard of. That's very important for executive function, decision-making, understanding social rules, things like that, right? So as we're gonna see later, love and relationships are not just rewarding in terms of pleasure and enjoyment, but also they can have an effect on our executive behaviors too, right? Which is pretty interesting, okay? So like I was saying, I mostly have studied drugs, but I recently have been getting into how these natural rewards, food, water, sex, but also social interactions uh, have an effect on uh, all kinds of different behaviors, right? So that's sort of the basics of the biology that we're working with here. When we find something motivating or stressful or rewarding, so stress and reward can be motivating, so that's why we say motivation, it activates our autonomic nervous system. So I want you guys to think about this in your own life, in your own relationships, or your own experiences. Uh, what happens when we feel something good, feel something rewarding, or feel something stressful? We can ignore this part, the parasympathetic. That's for when you're like sleeping or resting. What I'm more interested in is the sympathetic nervous system. Like what happens when you do get stress? So everybody think about like when you took a really big exam or something like that, right? Or if you had a big job interview, you get a little stressed out. Your pupils get bigger, your hands get a little sweaty, your heart rate goes up, all that kind of stuff, right? Think about a uh, relationship you're in, right? Either good times or bad times or both. 
Whenever we're excited and rewarded and feel pleasure, the same kind of things happen. Our heart rate goes up, pupils get bigger. Uh, you might have heard people talk about the butterflies that you feel in your stomach, right? This is all sympathetic nervous system and it's preparing us for an action, right? So the sympathet sympathet sorry, sympathetic nervous system, we can say is the four Fs. Uh, we can see if anybody knows what they are. You can just say it to yourself. But the first one is fight, right? Like if a bear is chasing you, you want to fight. Flight, or maybe other people might run away from a bear, which is what I would do, right? Uh, we also see these changes during feeding, right? And can anybody think of the fourth F? I'll be impressed. You can tell me afterwards if you got it or not. Fight, flight, feeding, and... Right, sex, exactly, right? Very good, right? Not really enough, but you get where I'm going with that, okay? So we're gonna talk about a couple of those things and keep in mind your sympathetic physiological activation as we're talking about these different behaviors, okay? All right, so love is conserved by biology, we can say. It's rewarding and it activates our fight or flight. So as we go through, I want you to think about like these biological or evolutionary influences that support relationships but also how humans can control these biological influences. So I'm gonna try in the next 20 minutes to go through these three stages here, right? We have lust, attraction, and attachment. And if you've ever heard uh, Dr. Campbell talk about anything, usually lust in these uh, lasts about a couple weeks to a couple months. Then if the relationship progresses, you get into attraction, which is more about six months to 18 months, right? And then attachment, you can think long-term relationships, marriage, things like that is two years plus, right? So what I'm gonna try to show you is what hormones and what neurotransmitters are gonna be involved in each of these stages. So what are the biological influences and why do we act certain ways or feel certain ways. If anyone's interested, uh, this is based on uh, a sociologist, Helen Fisher. It's really, really interesting stuff. Right? Okay, first, lust. We all know mammals, all mammals express a sex drive, right? And so in other species, this is really obvious, like very obvious. If you ever see nature documentaries of chimps or bonobos or gorillas, they have very uh, salient features that occur in moments where they wanna be sexually active. I always study rats, so what I notice in rats is every four or five days, female rats will go through estrus, where their estrogen peaks, and that's when they wanna engage in sexual activity. And male rats can figure that out because female rats will do certain things. They do ear wiggles, like really fast ear wiggles, and males have to be able to pick up on that, right? They also do a thing called a hop and a dart, where if a male approaches them, they'll hop and then kind of dart away. So we have these very obvious features for female rats. Not so common in deer or males, sorry, but like male red deer, they only have antlers for about one month when their testosterone is really, really high. And when their T levels go really low, those antlers go away and they have no interest in females, right? So animal studies show us that testosterone and estrogen have a huge influence on mating and partner behavior. Not so obvious in humans, as you might've guessed, maybe that might make, make, might make life easier or might make it harder sometimes, right? But in general, Males, human males, have T levels that are pretty flat all the time, right? All the time. Females, on the other hand, go through the menstrual cycle and they have this high level of estrogen every 28 days or so for about a week or two. And we're gonna be able to see some differences in behaviors or desires during this level of high estrogen versus levels of low estrogen, right? The other thing we see is early love, like the lust stage, there's high levels of cork or cortisol, which is a stress hormone that activates your physiological system, your pupils, your sweat glands, your heart rate, all that kind of stuff. We'll get into this a little bit later, but in longer marriages, I've been married about seven years. I should probably know that, right? Seven years, um, you see lower levels of estrogen and testosterone and maybe some differences in sexual behavior. It's different for everybody. And we see more high, sorry, higher levels of other hormones like oxytocin, which we'll get to a little bit later, right? So that's kind of an interesting dichotomy between the lust early stages of the first few months and then years later, right? 
So we know that love activates some of the reward regions that we were talking about earlier, right? When you give, give uh, people a picture of their significant other or someone they're dating, when they're in an MRI tube, you can see that the VTA lights up, the PFC lights up, and the nucleus accumbens lights up. That's indicative of reward, love, motivation, right? Another area is the insula, which is kind of on the side right here on the outside. Um, it's emotional ideas, our amygdala, we usually associate with fear, but it also has a lot to do with your emotions, positive emotions. And of course, hippocampus, because we're learning what we like and what we don't like, and uh, cues and features about people that we're interested in, right? So, Take a moment and think about yourself. You can give me examples if you want later, but you don't have to. Uh, if you or you know someone who's been love struck, think about what happens to their behavior, right? Often their social judgments are poor. They're not quite as accurate. Their decision-making. Uh, they do things they normally wouldn't do because they have poor judgment. And they have differences in how they evaluate whether someone is trustworthy or not right? With their own emotions and feelings, but also with their physical being, right? So we also know love struck people have lower fear, lower negative emotions. They're happy, you know, love struck, like enjoying life. Everything's great, right? And they have an enhanced mood. We know that a lot of that has to do with T levels being higher, estrogen levels being higher, and those interactions with our rewarding chemicals in our brain, right? So just real quick, we know that testosterone levels have a lot to do with competitions, not amongst males, but also females. And there's tons of evidence for this in sports, uh, Facebook arguments, uh, even chess, right? Even chess, winners have higher levels of testosterone. And we see this with the whole alpha male thing in uh, animal societies, hierarchical societies, right? Animals with lower testosterone tend to have a lower sex drive, even erectile dysfunction issues, not quite as clear cut in humans. I threw this up here. If anyone likes reality TV, this is an example of The Bachelorette, which is a very competitive situation where one person is basically dating 25 and one will be the winner, right? And supposedly they get married, okay? That drives a lot of competitive behaviors that increases testosterone in men as well as women. So you can see down here, in a situation like that, testosterone is important in women for sex drive, right? So it's not just estrogen, but T levels are important for females as well, right? Uh, for example, in women with, uh, who are undergoing menopause, uh, the drugs they use to increase sex uh, drive and sexual desire often are testosterone-based rather than estrogen-based, right? So both genders. Okay, so far, we know love is biological, evolution, we've got this reward system set up in our head, very similar to animals, and that we know the first stage, couple weeks, couple months, like the chemistry part, is uh, driven by hormones, right? So now I want you to think about how humans have the ability to control these biological influences and how humans might exhibit or show that they have these ideas to attract a partner. So we'll move on to the attraction phase. Animals do this in a lot of ways. I told you earlier, female rats with the ear wiggles and the hops and the darts. Uh, peacocks is a great example. Uh, we study birds a lot in hormones um, and males have these beautiful colors and beautiful songs. And uh, female birds have fewer songs and fewer colors because they're the ones that get to choose. The males have to be attractive in their songs and their um, physical features so that they can be chosen for a relationship, right? Humans kind of do the same thing. And while these attraction things are happening, we're looking at increases in dopamine and uh, serotonin, right? Which is 5-HT, right? So displays of attraction have been found in 147 of 166 human societies, like all over the world. Like we said, love is cross-cultural. And in these cases, Humans, when they're in love and they're attract, attracted to somebody, will focus more on positives and ignore negatives. You guys ever done that before? Anybody have an old boyfriend or girlfriend where they only focused on the good stuff and kind of ignored all the other stuff, right? You remember trivial events, small things they said. Uh, everything is fun and exciting. We're very euphoric. Um, humans and animals will do mate guarding 
right? Show behaviors saying, this is my partner. I'm attracted to them. They're attracted to me. So leave them alone, right? And we see that fight or flight activation, the butterflies, the sweaty hands, you know, you get a little bit nervous when you're going out with someone and you're planning a date, things like that. Right. So in some uh, areas of research, we call this like the love object. You're really, really focused on that person because they make you feel rewarding, right? Rewarded. They make you motivated. So there's a couple biological indicators of attraction. And the basic ones are what we think of as secondary sex characteristics. And uh, these are the things that come up at puberty. So for uh, women, it's usually uh, increases in breast tissue and hip size, uh, differences in cheekbones. For males, it's uh, more of a strong jaw and then their shoulders get bigger and wider. The voice deepens. So just think all the stuff that happens uh, during puberty, right? These are signs that biologically speaking, people find attractive, right? So in animals, like female rats, we only see that for a couple days. Humans, that's very prolonged. Those features are always there after puberty, right? But when we get outside of the biological part, uh, we see that this attraction can be impermanent, right? And romantic attraction can fade away. So think of someone you might've dated for a couple months, and then it just kind of petered out. And there wasn't necessarily anything wrong, just the attraction, the chemistry that just wasn't there anymore. So maybe we're not as motivated to be with them or to uh, be rewarded by their presence as we once were. I just thought this was kind of cool. That can happen a lot, right? Uh, unless there's a barrier and it's called frustration attraction, the whole Romeo and Juliet thing. If someone tells you, you can't date that person, you can't be with that person for whatever reason, the dopamine and the serotonin levels stay high and you remain attracted to that person, right? Think about like your parents said, you can't date that person, they're not good for you. Or something like a long distance relationship, right? Maybe we might stay in a relationship that we know the attraction maybe isn't there anymore, but we're still feeling it because of that barrier. It's kind of an interesting idea. We could bring that up later if we want. So facial symmetry is a physical sign, a genetic sign of good genes. So for females, most males typically, right? Theoretically, stereotypically, we'll be looking at cheekbones, high cheekbones, a delicate jaw, fuller lips. Whereas males, attractive signs are defined cheekbones and a stronger jaw and things like that. Like I said, the big shoulders, right? So this is one way we can tell if someone is a high quality mate. And I wanna make really sure that uh, this is purely biological, purely evolutionary. This is about genetics and uh, surviving in a harsh environment like way back 50,000 years ago but we still look for these things, right? So if you look at these pictures, we like symmetry. We find that attractive. So if you show this picture to someone, most often they'll find these pictures on the bottom more attractive because they're more symmetrical. So this is a real picture up here. And then these ones, they just flip the face so it's a mirror image, so it's symmetrical. And people identify this as more attractive. I'll talk about this real quick, just because I think it's super interesting. Uh, animals navigate the world by smell a lot. Humans use vision, but we still have a lot of importance associated with smell. And we can talk or learn about a partner through smell and major histocompatibility complex. Basically what that means in layman terms is that if you find someone's natural odor, their body odor, not like stale body odor, they haven't showered in three days, but like normal body odor, if you find that attractive, then that means you have compatible genes, right? So we want someone with different genes than us because it's a lower likelihood that we'll get a uh, recessive gene disorder or something like that. So in terms of genes, opposites attract, right? Theoretically, through smell, we could tell, does it smell like this or does it smell like this, right? So females tend to prefer the body odor of men who are more symmetric, like Brad Pitt, right? And that have a different gene set than them and that have typically stereotypically masculine features, the shoulder, the jaw, the deep voice, stuff like that, right? If you have any questions about this, we can definitely get into that later, right? Because there's a lot of social influences. And remember that we can um, 
override these biological impulses. Right? Okay, I'm gonna go a little quick through here, so in the interest of time, I just wanted to show you real quick, I said males pretty flat across the board, right? So one way of looking at that is males are always ready to engage in sexual relationships, looking for attractive features because their hormones are pretty static till they get about 45, 50, 60, right? <laughs> Females, on the other hand, human females, have this fluctuation where for a couple of days they have higher levels of estrogen than other parts of the cycle, right? There's a ton of interesting research on this, but during this part of the cycle, females, on average, not everybody, are more attracted via smell to men with high court levels and high testosterone levels. I can go into this more detail later, but the way they figured this out is they had a guy wear a shirt for a couple of days and then they put it in a bag and they had women smell it. So women, think about that if you wanna be involved in that for extra credit points, right? They could tell by the smell of the t-shirt if a male was more stereotypical testosterone high level or a little bit lower, right? Pretty interesting, pretty cool idea. Women are also a little bit more attracted to the facial symmetry stuff during this uh, cycle of high estrogen, um, women, on average, not everybody, are more likely to engage in extra pair copulations. Anybody figure out what that is? This is one of my favorite science terms, extra pair copulations. Uh, cheating, it means cheating. Extra pair, outside your pair, copulation, sex, right? And fantasies, these all peak with estrogen. So this is another pretty good sign that estrogen and testosterone and the reward that goes along with them are pretty linked to different behaviors, right? Uh, I found this study too, it was very interesting. Um, it was actually done by a friend of mine and I didn't even know he did this until I saw his name on the paper, but women are more attracted to courtship language during this part of the cycle of high estrogen. They get more reward and dopamine when they hear phrases like this, right? So think like love songs, all that kind of stuff. Pretty interesting, right? Okay, and again, remember all this stuff is biological, evolutionary. We have the ability to override these things, which is good for me because I'm not a stereotypical high testosterone guy. I'm just a nerdy professor, right? So my wife still ended up with me anyways, which is good, right? Okay, so, so far we know love is biological. We know evolution, the reward, we know that involves lust, we know that involves attractions, these very specific features, right? Uh, both social and biological. So this last section, two or three slides, four slides, I want you to think about how males and females have evolved these attractive features, like what we look for in a partner, what we find physically attractive, and then what we find socially attractive right? Are they good partners? Uh, so it's not just biology, it's a blending of these two things, okay? And I also want you to think about how in animals, females are typically the ones who get to choose who they will mate with, right? And this is most species, right? Rats, um, uh, all kinds of animals. Birds is another really good example of that. Okay, so the last couple slides here is the pair bonding. And if you guys haven't heard of this, the oxytocin, is a hormone that everybody has uh, and it goes up when we're in a pair bonded relationship, right? And I'll give you guys a couple examples. So humans tend to pair bond for long periods of time. Think like marriage. It's not necessarily just a social construct. There's also a lot of evolutionary theories saying it was good for humans to have a partner because it made it easier to raise babies and make sure your genes survived. Only about 3% of mammals uh, will pair bond for life. One example is these little guys, the voles. And there's two different species, they're cousins. Prairie voles mate for life. And they have a very, very high level of oxytocin. So when they have a partner and have babies, they're basically married. Their cousins, on the other hand, not so much. They're very polygamous is, is one way to put it. These guys and girls have very low oxytocin levels, right? The cool part is, or the interesting part is, if I give oxytocin to mountain voles, they will become monogamous. And if I block oxytocin in prairie voles, they will become polygamous. So this is a pretty good causative experiment showing that oxytocin is supporting pair bonded relationships, okay? So I get a lot where uh, 
people will say, oh, well, you know, males evolve to have many partners and as many babies as possible. And it's not necessarily true. There's a lot of evidence showing that as humans developed caveman style 40,000, 50,000 years ago and started to walk upright, they needed help. So think if mom is carrying a baby, she can't find food, get food, protect herself. So she's protecting the offspring and then they need a partner to protect them. So it made sense that humans would evolve together and that they would have children that evolved the same way to grow up to have a partner because it was beneficial. And in humans, what we do see is that people in long-term relationships do have higher oxytocin levels than people who are not in long-term relationships. Like I said earlier, people in long-term marriage, right? This is somewhat correlational, but there's some evidence for this. Men with higher testosterone levels are more likely to divorce, have extra pair copulations, and be aggressive. And again, correlational. Men with lower T uh, are more likely to be more active parents, be more honest, and show more pro-social behaviors. I just threw this up here. You guys know who that is? It's Arnold, right? He obviously had a lot of testosterone and he's a very stereotypical like male, right? So I don't know too much about his relationships, but I was just an example of like a stereotypical high testosterone guy. And I want you to think back. Remember, even if a male like Arnold has high levels of testosterone, he doesn't have to engage in extra pair copulations. His PFC helps him avoid that because because he knows it's not a pro-social behavior. So don't fall in the trap of saying, oh, high T levels equals a person who cheats or a person who only wants sex or something like that, right? Oh, I forgot about this guy. This little guy is a California mouse. He has high levels of vasopressin, which is the same thing as oxytocin. He actually uh, raises the kids. Once the babies are born, mom takes off. And he's one of the few examples where dad is taking care of the babies and raises them. So oxytocin, really important. We call it the bonding hormone, the social hormone, the love hormone, it's super interesting, right? Has a lot to do with social memories, like who you trust and who you support. Uh, people with high levels of oxytocin have lower levels of stress, lower levels of anxiety, okay? So just to give you guys an idea of when we release oxytocin in males and females, a lot of maternal behaviors that are intended to pair bond with your child. So during vaginal birth, for example, during uh, vaginal contractions, oxytocin is released, and during the act of breastfeeding, milk left out. Also, skin-to-skin -skin contact is a big one. Uh, if anyone's had a baby or knows someone uh, who had a baby um, and you talk to them about it, right after birth, they do skin-to-skin -skin contact where baby and mom just lay on each other, right? And that promotes oxytocin release and bonding. We see the same things with sexual partner behaviors, right? Oxytocin is released during intercourse. Uh, higher levels is released if there's an orgasm, right? Males and females, and also skin to skin contact. Hugging, holding hands, just being close to each other, that kind of stuff promotes oxytocin release and promotes attachment behaviors, right? Okay, almost done, two more slides. So we know love is biological, right? We know there's reward. We know it involves the first stage of lust, like the chemistry stage with the hormones where it's exciting and everybody's into it and it's like fireworks and explosions. And then we go into attraction, you know, six months, 12 months, 18 months. And that has a lot to do with, do I find you physically attractive, right? What is it about you that um, I'm drawn to? We know dopamine and serotonin go up in these stages, right? This is where we're learning if we have a good compatibility with somebody, right? So sometimes attraction fades out unless you have a barrier, but if it keeps going, you find attachment, right? So my wife and I like a lot of the same stuff. We have a lot of the same goals. We have a lot of the same values. We decided we wanted to raise our children the same way. So in our relationship, I've never measured my oxytocin levels, but I'm guessing they're a little bit higher than they would be because we're still in a long-term relationship. I'm guessing she has higher oxytocin levels as well. This promotes the pair bonding and the loving behaviors. So to wrap it all up, two slides. 
Uh, this is your brain on love, right? Just like your brain on drugs. Uh, you can see all the different parts of the brain that are involved in love. It's all over the place. There's old parts that give you reward and motivation. There's newer evolutionary parts that have to do with decision-making and things like that, right? So if we go through, you can see like dopamine, pleasure, motivation, oxytocin, trust, trust, attachment. So these levers can go up and down right? Depending on the stage you're in. Maybe in the early stages, cortisol is higher, right? Maybe now at the later stages, dope means a bit lower, but oxytocin is a bit higher, right? So maybe that's a good indication that our pair bonding, the attachment's good, even if the fireworks aren't necessar necessarily there all the time, right? So I like this graph or this image because you can see how it's a blend of all of these different stages together, and we'll see different combos at different times. So lust, attraction, attachment, pretty uh, strong evidence showing that humans go through these three stages, right? So if anything, what I want you guys to get out of the talk today is that love is very powerful, right? Because of hormones, it's very rewarding, but also in longer term relationships, we can find it to be very secure. Right. So love is super complex. It's not just biological. There's a lot of social rules. There's a lot of cognitive aspects to it. So it's not just biology. It's how biology and psychology work together. So to finish it, our behavior is shaped by biology, not controlled by it. Right. And in terms of children, these partner related behaviors are pretty important because how we act with each other in a partner relationship will have an effect on our children's development. All right, uh, Dr. Eggers, if you want to take that over, hope that made sense. Excellent. Dr. Quillen, thank you so much. That was really interesting stuff. And um, I really appreciate you sharing all of that with us and your expertise. Um, I want to remind folks uh, in the audience, there's still time to submit questions. If you'd like, you can simply put them uh, in the chat. We do have um, a handful of questions, Matt, and they, they kind of range from the more technical around some of the, you know, biological, neurological kinds of things you're talking about, and then, you know, more broad questions about just the nature of love and relationships, et cetera. So I'll do my best to give them to you in kind of an, 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 an organized fashion. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the questions was asked related to, uh, uh, a topic you were just talking about towards the end, which has to do with kind of differences in 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 males and females, and and the question uh, that was asked is, you know, based on hormones or sort of other you know biological mechanisms, um, are are there differences between men and women in terms of who are more likely to engage in extra pair copulations? Sure, uh, and like I said, that's I love that term, right? And uh, <laughs> uh, it's basically just cheating. Uh, so I don't. I think a big thing to remember is that there's all these biological influences. So like rats, uh, the males tend to be more uh, promiscuous. So we see in the voles, there's those two, two different species. Um, I think if we did a, uh, I probably should have looked it up, but if we did a um, study of people who had cheated and people who hadn't, uh, it would probably be a wash, right? Because high testosterone alone doesn't make you a cheater. Higher levels of oxytocin don't make you a better partner. I think it's a combination of all these biological, social, uh, all these different things working together. I remember someone asked me once, uh, she said, I'll never forget her. She said, oh, my boyfriend cheated on me, but we're still very much in love. And he, he apologized. And so we're trying to work it out. She's like, can I give him a shot of oxytocin and then he'll be a better partner? And I was like, that's a great idea. You probably can't do that. <laughs> but theoretically, the theory is there. And I saw where she was coming from. Uh, but the other part of it is he can learn and understand the rules of his relationship. And then he can find reward and love and security in that social part of their relationship if that makes sense excellent yeah no that that really does okay so um related to that question matt um and and and, and it was really what you were just speaking to towards the tail end of it uh, so i thought it was a good one to combine someone asked about um you know sort of the uh the power the importance of these biological neurological explanations and can you talk a little bit about you know how important they are, how much of a role they play in determining how, as humans, we behave in the context of love, right? And, you know, how much, I, I don't know if now I'm adding my own term to it, but, you know, 
the extent to which we sort of have freedom and control versus, you know, we're impacted by uh, these biological processes? Right. I think it's a really great question. It's a really important idea, and there's a lot of layers to it. But again, it's the biology and the so uh, social aspect of it together, right? I think these biological influences that I talked about are really important, and I think they're really strong, but it's not everything, like at all, right? Uh, for example, uh, I'll just throw this out there. You can answer to yourself and give yourself a gold star. Uh, if anybody knows when the PFC, your decision-making, your impulse control center is fully formed, it's about 25 for males, 22, 23 for females, right? And then think about how you acted when you were a teenager. Not you, Dr. Ayers, other people, right? I'm sure you're a people. But like teens are more likely to do things impulsively, whether it's um, trying drugs or jumping off the roof of a house into a pool or engaging in an extra pair of copulation, right? Um, so because their PFC isn't fully formed yet. So I think we can kind of explain part of teenage behavior or lust related behavior by these really strong rewarding impulses and hormones. But we also have the ability as humans to overcome those. Rats do not, rats don't have a great PFC. Um, Chimps do, but they still engage in these extra pair copulations, right? Humans are very, very special because of our PFC. So that's why when you get in a relationship, I think it's important. And I'm not a relationship expert. I'm a reward a dopamine expert. But I always think it's good to set the rules and say, this is what I think is going on. And then you won't have to worry about what those biological impulses are. Right? I guess the short answer is we can control them if we really want to. Excellent. Appreciate that. Um, you've mentioned oxytocin a couple of times. One of the questions that came up is, are there, uh, what are the other kinds of life activities that increase oxytocin? The big one is for um, during birth. And that's like the primary one where we see huge spikes because obviously we want mom and baby to be bonded. And actually when uh, both my two kids, I told my wife about all this stuff and she had been reading some things, uh, males too. So she made me, she didn't make me, but she, highly suggested that I do skin to skin contact with uh, my babies. And I thought it was bonding, right? Because I didn't just spend nine months with this little person hooked up to me. So I needed to, you know, instigate that relationship, right? For adults, I think it's the physical things like um, hugging, right? Uh, hand holding, cuddling, stuff like that. There is evidence showing that oxytocin levels go up when people do things like that. But also the social part of it, you feel close to someone when you do things you like together, right? Shared activities, going for a hike, going to see a movie, eating dinner together. Um, I can't cite any evidence showing that that increases oxytocin, but I think it does uh, promote that attachment as well, right? So again, not purely biological. We've got to add the social stuff in there. Excellent. Thank you. I'm going to shift to some, some kind of more broader questions. Um, one of our attendees asked, um, do you believe in the concept of falling in love? And I wonder what that might look like, you know, biologically. So from a biological point of view, uh, yes. And so, like I said, my background, um, this is going to get weird for a second, but my background is drug research. And so in drug research, when someone is addicted to something, it changes those reward pathways, the VTA, the nucleus cummins, dopamine levels. And we actually call the drug the love object, right? It's like someone's in a permanent lust stage with that drug and they forget about everything else. And I think we see the same pattern of behaviors in people when they feel like they're in love with somebody, right? Sometimes it's healthy, sometimes it's not, right? But we see that the same brain systems are activated. So in general, I would say, yes, your brain does support you being in love by promoting hormone release, dopamine release, and then eventually oxytocin release, right? Another question, you know, in that same vein is, um, was asking, you know, again, about kind of differences between men and women. And, and um, would you characterize the, the uh, experience of love as different in the way men experience it versus the way women experience it? Sure. Uh, and, you know, I always try to be careful when I talk about stuff like this, because we're talking about 
gender stereotypes and you know they're stereotypes for a reason because uh, some people exhibit them some people don't but again we also have the ability to control these things right so in general in general women tend to be more expressive about their feelings and their emotions in general and uh, males typically are not so i really think that uh, that's partly evolutionary but mostly social there's a lot of social pressures for males to act a certain way um, like i grew up uh, I wasn't really allowed to talk about, you know, if I was feeling stuff or crying because my dad was like, just suck it up. Right. So I think there's a lot of social pressures. Uh, but then people always ask me, well, what about animals? Only 3% of animals are in mammals specifically are in pair bonded relationships. Uh, the voles, there's some penguins that do it. Uh, a couple birds do it. Um, uh, and I say, well, that's very different because those animals evolved in a certain way, whereas humans evolved a little bit differently. So I think maybe initially in the initial stages of human evolution, the idea was that, oh, males spread their seed, high levels of testosterone, whereas women, they uh, are more careful about their relationships because they have to take care of the baby stereotypically, right? Um, so they're more careful about who they partner with, right? But I think as humans evolved and we have all these societies and humans working together, uh, humans do work better as, a, uh, as partners because they can help each other, right? If you want me to get really technical, this might be a little iffy, but one of the theories is that uh, like in one male ejaculation, there's like 7 million to 10 million sperm. Whereas during one menstrual cycle, a woman releases one egg, right? So obviously, purely biologically speaking, women tend to be more careful about that, whereas men are not. But again, we have the ability to overcome those things and it's not like a biological imperative. Uh, and as we've seen through evolution, pair bonding in human works. Matt, you know, one of the things um, we have a lot of folks in our audience uh, today and, and folks who will, you know, watch this later who are in the community and they're working with families, they're working with adults, they're working with folks in relationships. And there was a question, you know, sort of about the usefulness of some of this for, you know, in supporting the in, in supporting folks in the community. And so I wonder if you could could speak a little bit to like, you know, how might how might we use some of the information you shared today? To, to, you know, to make an impact to, to folks in the community? Sure. Um, one thing is I don't want people to, it's really important to me that people don't say, oh, well, I have high testosterone, so I'm just a cheater. It's like a self-fulfilling prophecy or anything like that, because it's not true, right? Um, and the other thing is we can use this kind of stuff to say, well, how can I improve my own relationship, right? So like if uh, I'm sure most people, if not all people in here have had a partner and you were through the lust stage and you're into the attraction stage and you find them physically attractive and then all of a sudden you're like, I just don't like feel like I could have a long-term relationship with this person. Nothing's wrong. You're attracted to them. It just doesn't feel like you have enough commonalities. It's like, it's okay to move on to another relationship. It's not like a failure or something like that. Staying in a relationship that you're not necessarily happily happy in, right? And then if we're in the attachment stage, like with a partner, like my wife and I, We've been married seven and a half years, almost eight years, and we have a six-year-old and a four-year-old. Uh, life is hard with little kids <laughs> and maintaining a pair-bonded relationship. And uh, so when I think about this stuff, I try to do things with my wife, like a date night or whatever, that helps us you know, stay close where we can hold hands or just have a quiet conversation. And theoretically, that will increase my oxytocin levels and keep us more pair bonded. Whereas if you think about it, people that don't touch or cuddle or engage in sexual behavior together, they're much more likely to lose the, not the ability, but lose uh, some of that oxytocin related attachment and feel like their relationship is failing. So I don't think these biological things create anything, but I think they're very important for understanding so we can support whatever stage of the relationship we're in and ultimately find someone with a long lasting relationship that we can maintain that and keep it going. Thank you. That's great. I think that's really helpful. Interestingly, there's another comment that kind of builds off that. And, and one of our attendees noted that, you know, a lot of the, a lot of what you're talking about speaks to love as it's tied to reproduction mm -hmm. and does this same sort of biological model of love or biological approach to understanding love explain the full range or types of love you know maternal paternal fraternal etc 
I think so in a lot of ways. And like I was saying, if we go back to the reward pathways um, in the beginning, if you guys look at the slides, um, look at them later, I will make sure they get posted. Mm -hmm. um, I showed you the slide about cocaine and which parts of the brain light up. Uh, same parts light up when you eat sugar or when you have maternal love or paternal love towards your children or partner love. And obviously it's not the exact same pattern. There's a lot different patterns like in the last brain slide I showed you. But I do think that there's a biological uh, basis for every kind of love, friend, friend love as well, right? Like uh, people I've been friends with since college, 25 years ago, right? Uh, I enjoy seeing them and I know I get a spike of dopamine release when I see them, especially during quarantines and I haven't seen a lot of them in a long time. Uh, so yeah, I think there's a, the underlying current of this is love is very powerful and binding because it's very biological, because we've evolved to need partners, for help, to help raise kids, and it helps us adapt to our environment, and that's what's made us successful, so we want to keep that around. That makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. We've got time just to wrap up with a couple of questions, and one is actually kind of a reverse take on this, so I, I'm, I'm curious to kind of hear your, your thoughts. Uh, one of our uh, attendees asked um, about I don't know if this is considered the opposite of love or not, but this idea of chronic loneliness. And the question was, you know, can chronic loneliness, you know, have, uh, does, does, does chronic loneliness have sort of similar physical effects on the brain? Um, I think it can. And that's a really interesting question. And there's a lot of reasons someone might feel chronic loneliness. I'm sure you guys have heard that there's been an increase uh, in suicide levels during quarantine because people are kind of alone and we don't know exactly why or how yet. Um, another analogy might be people who have depression um, and they have low levels of dopamine and low levels of serotonin. And they feel that loneliness, right? Um, we do know that if that goes untreated, like without proper um, medications in combination with proper treatment therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, insight therapy, whatever it is, that there can be brain damage. Uh, specifically with depression, which is highly associated with loneliness and um, you know low levels of everything, is you can have damage to the PFC uh, and damage to the hippocampus, which is also part of the stress pathway. Um, and so those are very sensitive parts of the brain. So if you're stuck in a cycle of this loneliness, one of the behavioral treatments is actually doing social things, right? Like joining a club, uh, forcing yourself to go talk to people, family members or friends, or um, even online communities. So it's interesting to me that the treatments for people with chronic loneliness, for whatever reason, involve social behaviors that will boost oxytocin and dopamine. Fascinating. Yeah. No, I saw that was kind of, seemed like a really interesting yeah. twist on, on things you've been talking about. So I appreciate you taking the time to speak to it. You know, the last thing that I'll ask, uh, Matt, is that a couple folks have asked, are there any book suggestions or other resources that you might recommend um, that they pursue. And, and I, will, I will let the audience know as well that um, once this recording gets posted on our YouTube page, we will provide a list, you know, any ideas that, that sure. were mentioned by Dr. Quinlan in his talk or other ones that come up, we'll, we'll make sure they're added and included with that link. But, but is there anything at the moment, Matt, that you would suggest? Um. Not off the top of my head, because I based this uh, talk, the webinar, I wanted to use um, peer reviewed research mostly. Um, and that's what I wanted to base it on because it is pretty technical. And also, like I said, I'm not like a relationship person. That's like Dr. Campbell, uh, that's her area of expertise. I'm kind of the reward kind of um, expertise, but I, I can think of a couple of things. There's a couple of TED Talks I like and a few researchers that I'm into, uh, and I'll definitely put together a little bit of a list and uh, we can post it up. So I'll get back to you on that one. Perfect. Perfect. There's uh, Sorry, real quick, there's one, I can't remember the speaker's name, but she gave a great talk on happiness and how it's important in life. And uh, she talks a little bit about the hormones that are involved and how and why we can and should be happy. And it's just, it's a really cool way of looking at life. So I'll definitely get that info to you. Terrific, terrific. I appreciate that. Uh, but with that, I want to give um, my sincere thanks to Dr. Quinlan 
for sharing his expert expertise and and sharing all this you know really interesting interesting material uh, with all of us today. And again, thank you for being here today. Have a wonderful rest of the day and be well.